Hello, welcome to another exciting episode of Miracles Happen. Today's program is filmed live in Memphis, Tennessee, and we've got a lot of exciting things to share with you in regards to Memphis, Tennessee. We are behind me is the magnificent Mississippi River. On the other side of the river is actually Arkansas. So stay tuned because we've got a great program for you. Welcome to Miracles Happen. Joan Hunter has been traveling the world in the healing ministry for more than 45 years. Be aware of what the enemy is trying to do to you and say, no more. She is hosted around the world for healing and miracle services because wherever she goes, miracles happen. Joan shares her tenacious faith in how to pray for the sick. Bringing people here and sending them out to the four corners of the earth. That's my job. She traveled the world with her parents, Charles and Francis Hunter, for over 30 years. I expect a miracle tonight. Joan sees healing, signs, and wonders happen all the time in the name of Jesus, and she wants to share this with you. As anointed as I am, so are you. Whether it's filmed on location at Joan Hunter Ministries in Tomball, Texas, or from around the world, you can be sure to hear good news and receive the resounding message that miracles happen. God has anointed in the area of healing, body, mind, soul, spirit, and finances. So stay tuned and join us for this week's extraordinary episode of Miracles Happen. God is a God of hope who heals the body, spirit, and soul. Are you ready for your miracle? Miracles Happen. As I travel all over the world, it's so exciting to be able to stop and just take a moment. And, and I mean, the weather is absolutely gorgeous here. But in Memphis, what is Memphis known for? Barbecue. Yes, we did have barbecue last night, and it was very, very good. And we're going to have barbecue probably sometime today again, which is really, we're going to have a fun time having barbecue. But it's also known for the blues. It's known for Elvis Presley. And it's also known for Martin Luther King Jr. and a variety of other things here. So we're going to have a lot of fun just going through the different parts of the city, different situations that's happened here through the years. Many of you are aware of everything that's been going on in the world. You think, oh, when is this recorded? Does it matter? Because this is a, 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 a something, a situation that is just always ongoing. And that is division. Division in the church, division amongst denominations, division in families. The enemy wants to divide us because as they divide us, they can conquer. But we must stand together in unity. And families can be divided. I know that situations come up and, and then that nobody wants to talk to each other. This needs to stop. Different churches, even within the church, this group, that group, uh, and, and Christians, friends, things that divide us, uh, racial, racial situations that divide can divide. But you know what? There's always going to be pain. There's always going to be division um, in, on this earth, so to speak. Praise God in heaven, there won't be. around nine years old, my mother purchased for me a book on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She wanted me to read it because, you know, he's a positive figure and he, she wanted me to learn about somebody positive. Initially, I didn't want to read the book, uh, much rather I played video games or watched TV. I didn't care anything about that. Um, but I started reading the book and I was hooked. I was like, 
wow, this is this is really amazing. Like just his life and his passion and just his courage and all that was going on in our country at that time and some of it that's still going on now. And so after I read that first book, I wanted to learn everything I could about Dr. King. So I went to the library, I checked out every book I could find, I checked out every video, every documentary, and I was hooked. And the more I studied Dr. King, my passion for his life and his ministry really grew. And it got to the point where I said, I want to be just like him when I grow up. And what was he above all else? He was a preacher. He was a minister of the gospel. So when I was 13 years old, I preached my first sermon. A lot of the sermon was inspired by Dr. King, and I've been preaching ever since. Uh, March 17th uh, was 18 years since my first sermon. And uh, since then, I've been preaching. I've been reciting King speeches. I've been doing uh, reports on Dr. King's life, you know, Black History Moments and all that. And so, and to this day, I still say that Dr. King is my hero and inspiration, not just for the power of his speeches, but also just the example that he was, who he was, and the way that he lived, the words that he spoke. Dr. King initially, and, and, and people who knew him best will attest to this, he never set out to be famous. You know, he never set out to have a national platform. He, he certainly wanted to make a difference. He certainly wanted to change the world, but he basically wanted to be a local pastor, earn his PhD, raise his family, write some books, you know, kind of live somewhat under the radar. But, you know, from an early age, it was clear that he had a special purpose. You know, he skipped two grades in high school and graduated, uh, I'm sorry, entered college at 15 years old because he skipped the ninth and the 12th grade. So he entered Morehouse College. He was only 15 years old. He got his PhD at 26 years old. Okay, and so, and then as soon as he got his PhD while he was in his first pastorate in Montgomery, Alabama, that's when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus. And obviously that sparked the Montgomery bus boycott that lasted 381 days and resulted in the outlawing of legal bus segregation. And that immediately gave Dr. King a national platform. So from 1955, when the boycott began to when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, those 13 years, he was on a national platform and he died at 39 years old, so he accomplished so much in a short period of time. And uh, I think a lot of people limit Dr. King's contributions because they say, you know, he just gave great speeches or he just had a dream or, you know, because of him, there's no longer a white only sign or you can do all of that. And while those are definitely true, one should never discount the power of the speeches. No one should ever discount the progress that we've made as a nation. I think he also introduced a narrative that definitely needs to be uh, respected and listened to, the method of nonviolence, the method of passive resistance. Dr. King basically said that the best way to handle it is through love, is through peace, is through civil disobedience. There's a godly way to resist the injustice that we face, but we should never return hate for hate or violence for violence, because that's just gonna cause more stuff. Like one of my favorite quotes is when he he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hatred cannot drive out hatred, only love can do that. And there is a godly way to handle our anger. And he was definitely an example of that. And I think a lot of people mistake his, his patience and his forgiveness for weakness or being soft or docile or, you know, submissive, right? But that certainly wasn't him because it takes strength to return hate with love. It takes strength to not want to return violence with violence, right? It takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage to say, yes, they're, they're threatening me, they're hating me, they're scandalizing my name, but I'm still gonna love them and I'm not gonna sink to their level. You know, he always said, never let anyone pull you so low to hate them. And so I think that that's a huge impact because whether people agree with him or whether people don't, everybody knows Dr. King was about nonviolence, right? They know that he was not the one to go to if you were trying to start a riot or loot or, you know, uh, kill somebody. Like he wasn't the one to condone that. And while it's definitely gratifying to the flesh, right, to our human side, to want to return violence and, and seek revenge, ultimately Dr. King proves that you can commit to nonviolence, you can commit to peace, you can commit to some kind of unity while still uh, fighting against injustice and accomplish your goals. And so I think that's kind of the, the impact that he made where if anybody was to say peaceful protest doesn't work or nonviolence doesn't work or love doesn't work, which is a common narrative you hear, Dr. King proves that it does work, despite the fact that he was assassinated, right? Because a lot of folks think, well, since he was killed, does that mean that his movement failed? Absolutely not, because if his movement was a failure, they wouldn't have wanted to kill him. We need to be aware of other people's pain, but we also need to be aware of our own pain. 
And are we bringing anything divisive into relationships? Are we bringing division into churches? One thing is I co-pastored for 18 years uh, up until about 2000, that I discovered that people would come from a different church, but they would bring their pain and their hurt from another church into our church. And as they came in, they knew we were going to hurt them just like the other church did. And you carry around a spirit of offense and you get to the point where you're expecting to be hurt. You're expecting to be abused. You're expecting to be rejected. And we need to make sure that in our own hearts that we don't carry around a spirit of offense, uh, a spirit of rejection. Uh, you know, I, I can walk up to somebody and it's like, I'm gonna reject you before you reject me. I can feel that hand, even though it's not a physical hand, I can feel that shield coming at me, going, I'm gonna reject you before you reject me. And it's like, we have got to get rid of this heaviness of rejection, of division, of what can I find fault uh, in, in looking at every situation? How can I find fault with everything? No matter if it's a Christian leader, a, a leader of the United States, all these different things, we need to stop and, and we have to stop in our own self and stop bringing in division. And you think, well, I'm not doing that. Okay, I'm not saying that you are. What I'm saying is let's examine to see if we have any, any offense, any possibility of bringing division into the family, into the church. Well, they don't believe in speaking in tongues. They don't believe in healing. They don't. And it's like, then you put them down. No, they're serving God. And you just pray for God to open up their eyes to the whole Bible. And so as we go in, and, and literally as we go in, go in where? Go into the grocery store. As we go into church, wherever we go, make sure that we don't carry a divisive spirit with us. Joan Hunter Ministries travels around the world sharing the healing power of God. Joan Hunter Ministries is touching lives all over the world through live streaming events, books and teachings, and our prayer call center where miracles happen daily. All of this is made possible by your prayers and support. When you partner with Joan Hunter Ministries, you not only bless those who receive the message, but you open a supernatural flow of blessing into your own life. Today is the day that my God's gonna supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. Today is is the day that God's going to point to me as an example of His incredible wealth. To become a monthly partner with Joan Hunter Ministries, call 1-281-789-7500 or go to joanhunter.org. Today is a day of alignment. Today is a day for financial breakthrough. Today is a day for your healing. Today is the day I don't have to wait any longer for the promises. Go to joanhunter.org to give a one-time gift or text any amount you'd like to give to 281 771-1507. Become a partner with Joan Hunter Ministries today. Miracles are happening everywhere, and now you can proclaim it everywhere you go with the Miracles Happen t-shirt and blanket. The t-shirts come in all sizes and a variety of colors, as well as with rhinestones and without. The Miracles Happen t-shirt is available for men and women. Get your shirt today and watch as God opens doors for you to pray for the sick around you. Both the Miracles Happen t-shirts and blanket are a constant reminder for all of us that miracles happen everywhere. And check out His Healing Promises. His Healing Promises is a selection of scriptures on healing read by Joan Hunter. If you need encouragement about your healing or faith to trust in God in a difficult time, this is for you. Let your spirit be lifted, your hope restored as you listen to God's healing promises over your life. Go to miraclesappen.tv now to order your Miracles Happen t-shirt, blanket, or your copy of His Healing Promises. Or call 281-789-7500. Miracles I have a dream yeah. that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today.
The I Have a Dream speech, he gave that on August 28th, 1963 at the historic March on Washington uh, for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, that march was years in the making. Uh, the goal of that march was to push for civil rights legislation. Uh, at that time, you know, Jim Crow segregation was at its peak, pretty much. Uh, black people in this nation uh, didn't have access to basic public accommodations. And so Dr. King, along with a number of other civil rights organizers, figured one of the best ways to jive the point home to President John F. Kennedy and to Congress and to the government was to converge on Washington, D.C. in a peaceful march of over 100,000 people, which they had almost 300,000, so they certainly surpassed that number, uh, and to have speakers, to have singers, and basically just to say, you know, we demand our rights, we demand our freedoms, the freedoms that we've been promised as Americans, not just black Americans, but Americans, we have not received and we demand them, we deserve them. So Dr. King actually gave uh, he was one of the last speakers of the day, and by that point, he basically had rock star status. You know, a lot of the people that were at that march wanted to hear Dr. King speak because he was so known as a national leader. His profile had so grown. He had had so many victories uh, in the civil rights struggle at this point. And the interesting thing about it that a lot of people don't know is that that day, was, that speech was actually not the first time he used the phrase, I have a dream. He had used that phrase fairly often in some of his speeches. That was just a common phrase that he used. And and the original version of the speech that he had, he had a paper speech right in front of him. And so you notice at the beginning of the speech, he's reading a lot, like, because he starts talking about the Emancipation Proclamation and the history of slaves, the enslaved Africans being freed, but yet, a hundred years later, they're still not free. They're still not receiving their rights. And then he goes on to say that America has, has, has uh, written an insufficient check for our freedom. The check has come back marked insufficient funds because we haven't gotten our freedom. And then he starts talking about, you know, we can't be satisfied in our nation as long as this is happening or that is happening. And he goes through all these scenarios. And so that was kind of his mindset that, you know, we have gone through some very difficult times. And if I have anything to do with it, my children won't have to face some of the things that I face. And while we definitely have a long way to go, because of a lot of the efforts of Dr. King and so many others in the movement, Dr. King's children, as well as our children, and of course us, right, have reaped the benefits of a lot of that hard work. But that's really how that speech came to be. And, you know, from that day on, uh, one historian said on that day, he reached the peak of his popularity. He would never be, you know, revered like that again in his lifetime. That speech definitely had a huge impact. That certainly wasn't all that he was but you cannot understate, or overstate rather, the power of that speech. It was around March of 1968. Uh, the sanitation workers here in Memphis, Tennessee were not being paid fairly. In fact, many of them were not being paid at all. And, and so it got to the point where they decided to go on strike because they were not getting paid, and yet they were doing all kinds of work. So Dr. King got wind of what was going on. And so his, he, and he came to Memphis in March. Uh, he spoke at Mason Temple, and he offered his support. And they actually proposed that they do a march downtown in Memphis to tell uh, Mayor Loeb at the time, that was the mayor's name, Mayor Loeb, uh, to, to change the policy so that the sanitation workers could go back to work and they can get their work. So the interesting thing about it is, like I mentioned before, Dr. King had been living under the threat of death since the 1955 bus boycott. So death was something that was hovering over him every single day. But, uh, you know, the house was bombed. Like I said, he was stabbed. He was constantly threatened. At one point during a protest, someone threw a rock at him, so he was basically stoned. Uh, he was, you know, he was jailed about 30 times. And on many occasions, a number of people had him as the one that they wanted killed. So death was just hovering around him. But it was in 1963, a few months after the I Have a Dream speech, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And Dr. King looked at his wife as they were watching it on the TV and said, this is going to happen to me. I'm not gonna reach my 40th birthday. And it's ironic that when he gave that speech the night before he was killed. I've been to the mountaintop and he was talking about death again. And the next day when he gets killed, he was 39. He was 39 when all this happened and he said he would never reach 40. So if that's not irony and haunting, I don't know what is. So I'm happy tonight, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
he definitely had a feeling. And if you listen to the words that he used, you know, when he talked about, like anybody, I like to live a long life. He said, but I'm not concerned about that. I just want to do God's will. And he's, he's allowed me to go to the mountain. He started talking like Moses. And he said, I looked over and I've seen the promised land. But when he said those words, I may not get there with you. Right. And he said, though, and if you look at the look in his eyes, he was really he wasn't just saying that in passing. That wasn't fi- like, you know, that wasn't just filler. That was a deliberate statement. He meant to say, I may not get there with you. So in a way, he was kind of telling them goodbye. He was kind of saying, I brought you this far. God will take you the rest of the way. I've done my part, but our movement will continue. Our people are going to get there. I'm not going to be there with you when you get there, but you're going to get there. But one of the last things he said was, he said, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. So he had basically, he knew it was coming, but he, he was at peace with it. He accepted it. And if you hear the way he was talking about God, he knew that he had another destination. Hi, I just want to share with you some ideas that I have and feelings that I have in my heart. A lot of you know, I'm very much into seeing your dreams come to pass. And that now is a time to have our dreams resurrected and all that God has for us to do. Many of you may feel that you've you've had a dream, but you're too old. You have a dream, but you just can't live it out. But you know what? That's not God. And I remember, and I've, I know I've shared this many times, but it never gets old. He says, just remember who chose you. The world didn't choose you. I chose you, and I'm gonna use you. This is a time where God wants to resurrect your dreams one of Jesus' best friends, if he could have had a best friend, was Lazarus, and, it, and he died. And he was heartbroken over that, but he also knew the outcome. And he spoke over Lazarus to come forth. And for if you know the story, he had to use the name Lazarus, or we might have had a lot of bodies coming back. But he specifically spoke for Lazarus, his friend, to come back. And I want you today to speak to your dreams and to see them resurrected. Because as long as you can breathe, and we can breathe, that God wants to fulfill that dream in your life. There's many dreams that you may have had, but because of circumstances and life, because life happens, we know that miracles happen, but also life happens. And those are to keep us from fulfilling our dreams. As with Martin Luther King Jr., he had a dream that the world thought would die when he died, but it didn't. Others picked up that dream. And I wanna encourage you that even though uh, your spouse may have died, a situation I'm being reminded of right now, husband and wife, and their dream was to travel all over the place and minister the the kingdom of God and pray for people and see people healed. And you know, and she ended up and she died. And, And she goes, and he goes, but I'm not done with that dream. I'm gonna fulfill the dream for both of us, for the kingdom of God. So whatever it is in your life that you're dealing with, I wanna encourage you to pick that dream up. I'm also reminded of Elijah and Elisha. And even though Elijah died, he went up to be with the Lord, but even though he was gone, his life, his dream, his anointing didn't die with him or didn't go with him, but uh, Elisha, went and picked up that mantle. And many times it's like, you know, different people have have died and I'll, I'll say died prematurely. And what is the call of God in their life? There are many, many, many mantles that are still available. People that have died that we know, you know, worldwide, that we know their names. And you know what, There's, they didn't completely fulfill their calling. So it's like, Father, whatever they didn't fulfill, I wanna take up their, their call, their dream, and I want to fulfill it. Some of you may have lost a child. And Father, I thank you that I'm going to be able to pick, not not let their dream die, not their destiny die with them. But Father, I thank you for that mantle coming to me so that I in turn can walk out that dream. And I want to take a moment and pray because I'm really sensing that it's, it's almost like the dreams are in cocoons and that they just can't get out. And some cocoons have actually been knocked off and to the ground. And I wanna encourage you that this is a time where God's gonna bring you out of your cocoon and so that you can walk out your destiny 
like you've never thought before. And I want to encourage you, don't quit. Just don't quit. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just send the word of healing, a breakthrough, break out kind of anointing. Father, I thank you for releasing the dreams, reminding them of the dreams that they had. Uh, there's somebody that even had one at two years old and thought, well, I'll never fulfill that dream. So Father, I thank you for opening up the cocoon, opening up the dream that during that time has matured and is in a beautiful butterfly. And Father, I thank you that anything that is keeping us from walking out our dreams, that you in turn are going to just allow us to walk them out in a supernatural way. And Father, if there's anybody that thinks they're not good enough, you wouldn't have called them if you didn't think they were good enough. So Father, I thank you for opening up their eyes and showing them they are good enough. Father, I thank you for using them and making their dreams come alive again in Jesus' name. We've just had a great example of the power of your words. And many times we speak things that I know I'm not gonna live very long. I keep speaking I'm gonna live to be 120. So this is, I, I keep my confession going out there a few years in advance for sure. But see, we've had words spoken over us that will never amount to anything. That we're gonna, and sometimes we speak, I just feel like I'm gonna die young. Well, you need to cut those words off. That I'll never fulfill my dreams, okay? famous statement that I always make is shut your mouth. Let's get our mouth in line with the word. And, and I, let's just pray and just, Father, I renounce any words that I have said that is against me and against my life and against others. In Jesus' name, I renounce those words and I cut those words off to have any effect over me or anybody I have ever spoken them over. Forgive me for speaking those words. I repent of that in Jesus' name. Take this sin from me, put it on the cross, never to be held against me again. And watch what God will do. God, and ask God to hold you at a higher level of accountability of your words. And he will, which is really exciting. And I want to encourage you, this is a time and a season to really get our hearts healed of any kind of unforgiveness, division, spirit of offense. And if you need help, and having somebody pray with you, I want to encourage you to call the ministry at 281-789-7500 because I have a team there that I personally have trained to pray with you as if it's me praying. But the point is, Jesus wants you healed, but he wants you whole. Amen? Thanks so much for watching Miracles Happen Today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've learned as I've prepared this for you and I've learned from uh, Joseph and he was so amazing in the revelation that he had. And I hope you've enjoyed this program as I have enjoyed listening and also doing it for you. And just remember next week, we're gonna have another amazing program of Miracles Happen. Miracles Happen. Thanks for watching Miracles Happen. Contact us at miraclesHappen.tv or give us a call at 1-281-789-7500 or connect with Joan on Facebook at facebook.com slash Joan Hunter. And make sure to join us next week for Miracles Happen. God is a God of hope who heals the body, spirit, and soul.